Greetings, everybody. Chaplain Bob Walker here, Light of the World Ministries. In John 8, 12, Jesus said, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. This is going to be part four of Peace and Safety. There will probably be a part five. Uh, in part three, as a recap, the Israel decided... They didn't want the Lord as king. They said, give us a human king. And, uh, well, there was a whole bunch of bad kings. One of them was uh, Ahab and his wife Jezebel. And Ahab wanted to buy a vineyard next to his palace or home. And the guy didn't want to sell it. He's like, you know, hey, this is my family's heritage. I got to give this to my, um, you know, my kids. So he was sulking and unhappy, the king. And his evil wife, who was even worse than him, had the guy killed and stole it. So, you know, you think the Lord would have done that? No. So the Lord is basically, he said in, uh, you know, in 1 Samuel chapter 8, basically the Lord said, you know what? They want a human king. Uh, they can have him. No problem. So guess what? Since we didn't, our ancestors, since we didn't want the Lord as king, He's going to let them have the king that they want. And it's going to end up being, you know, just like uh, in the book of Revelation. The beast will be their king. And we're going to see who is going to follow the Lord and who is going to follow the beast. And, of course, all the pre-tribbers are convinced they're not going to be here for this. So, and, of course, their churches will tell them, oh, well, you know, that we're not going to be here for this. So this, you know, this, this can't be right. You know, the mark of the beast, it's not the mark of the beast. This is just, uh, you know, to protect us from dirty cash, to keep us from getting infected with COVID-19. So make sure you take your mark. Oh, wait, I mean, um, your uh, digital whatever money, because after all, you can't pay your tithes. So let's get going and take a look at some things going on. Now remember, the key to prophecy is the past. The history in the Bible from the past is generally the key to prophecy of the future. You know, Revelation takes all its symbolism from the Old Testament. I mean, it's it's there, people. And, you know, people that don't have a working knowledge of the Old Testament, you know, they read the New Testament, they read Revelation, and I just don't understand it. Of course not. Why would you? All the symbolisms in the old, you know, the Old Testament. The plagues that God gives in the book of Revelation are very, very similar. Some of them are the same as the plagues of Egypt prior to the first Passover. I mean, you know, the hail that came down. The waters that turned to blood. That's just two things. I mean, you know, they just don't get it. I I don't know. It's, uh, you know, if they're too lazy to read their Bible, they're going to get what they deserve, literally. I mean, you know, I have gone to so many different sites, Twitter, Facebook, uh, all these different sites, and beat my head against the wall trying to warn these uh, idiots and fools 
you know, not that I have all the truth. I, I know better than that. You know, but I give up. I'm pretty much at the point where I give up. If they're supposed to know, the Lord will show them. All right, let's get going. Now, remember, people, when we're, I want you to go to uh, the book of Ezekiel, chapter 7. Now, remember, America has had millions of abortions. Millions of them. I'm not even sure how many, but I'm sure it's well over 65 million. And um, there's all kinds of satanic groups. You've got all kinds of child kidnappings. And Lord knows what they're doing. These, these monsters are doing with the um, children that they're uh, trafficking in. What are they doing with them? Is it just um, using them for sex or are they actually killing them or both? You know, satanic sacrifices. You know, there's actually a church of Satan that they tolerate in this country. It was, it was incorporated on uh, June 6th. 1966, so 6666, yeah, and guess what co sure tribe member uh, incorporated it, you know, there's so much stuff going on, churches would not have tolerated this stuff 100 years ago, I mean, there would have been people hanging from trees 100 years ago. Today, eh, anything goes. There's nothing too evil that the church will not tolerate as long as they can get their little tithe money coming in. Oh, yes. All the, all the laws of God were nailed to the cross except for that tithe. Make sure you pay that tithe. So the point is, the church tolerates all the things uh, that God calls abominations. You know, you've got the uh, Sodomite marriages. I mean, let's face it. I mean, there, there's nothing too evil under the sun that churchgoers will not tolerate. And, I mean, they've even got tran vestites, drag queen story time for elementary school kids in libraries. I mean, really? I mean, you know, they might have two or three parents that actually protest. And then the, the count, city council members standing there with their armed police say, well, nobody else has complained. You're the only ones. And the pre-tribbers think that God's going to whisk them out of here with all this evil that they're tolerating. You know, when the Sodomites... And they are already in power. They're in power. When the witches, the wizards, and the sodomites, they know what the Bible says. Better than the church people. They are not going to tolerate the church people. They're going to, they're going to put them to death. And they're not even going to, the churchgoers are not even going to understand what's going on. And they're going to, God's going to give them a choice. Either die for their faith or deny Jesus. And if they deny Jesus, Jesus said he would deny them before the Father and his angels. So with that introduction, turn to uh, Ezekiel chapter 7, verse 1. And this could apply to America, Europe, UK, just as much as it did back in the day with Israel. 
Moreover, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Also thou son of man, thus saith the Lord God, unto the land of Israel, an end, the end, is come upon the four corners of the land. Now is the end come upon thee, and I will send mine anger upon thee, and will judge thee according to thy ways, and will recompense upon thee all thine abominations. And mine eye shall not spare thee, neither will I have pity, but I will recompense thy ways upon thee, and thine abominations shall be in the midst of thee, and ye shall know that I am the Lord. Thus saith the Lord God, An evil, and only evil, behold, is come, and end is come, the end is come, it watcheth for thee, behold, it is come. The morning is come unto thee, O thou that dwellest in the land, the time is come, the day of trouble is near, and not the sounding again of the mountains. Now will I shortly pour out my fury upon thee, and will accomplish mine anger upon thee, and I will judge thee according to thy ways, and will recompense thee for all thine abominations. And mine eye shall not spare, neither will I have pity. I will recompense thee according to thy ways, and thine abominations that are in the midst of thee, and ye shall know that I am the Lord that smiteth. Behold the day, behold, it is come. The morning is gone forth. The rod hath blossomed. Pride hath budded. Violence is risen up into a rod of wickedness. None of them shall remain, nor of their multitude, nor of any of theirs, neither shall there be wailing for them. You know what that means? That means... They're all going to be dead. There's not going to be anybody to mourn the dead because they're all going to be dead. Verse 12. The time has come, the day draweth near. Let not the buyer rejoice, nor the seller mourn, for wrath is upon all the multitude thereof. For the seller shall not return to that which is sold, although they were yet alive. For the vision is touching the whole multitude thereof which shall not return, neither shall any strengthen himself in the iniquity of his life. They have blown the trumpet even to make all ready, but none goeth to the battle, for my wrath is upon all the multitude thereof. The sword is without, and the pestilence and the famine within. He that is in the field shall die with the sword, and he that is in the city, famine and pestilence shall devour him. So if you're outside the city walls, you're going to be killed with the sword and war. If you're inside the city walls, there's not going to be any food. And if you don't have any food, disease is quick to follow. Disease always follows famine because if your body is not properly fed, you're prone to catch disease. Doesn't sound very good. Verse 16, But they that escape of them shall escape, and shall be on the mountains like doves of the valley, all of them mourning, every one for his iniquity. All hands shall be feeble, and all knees shall be weak as water. They shall also gird themselves with sackcloth, and horror shall cover them, and shame shall shall be upon all faces and baldness upon all their heads. They shall cast their silver in the streets and their gold shall be removed. Their silver and their gold shall not be able to deliver them in the day of the wrath of the Lord. They shall not satisfy their souls, neither fill their bowels, because it is the stumbling block of their iniquity. As for the beauty of his ornament, he set it in majesty, but they made the images of their abominations and of their detestable things therein. Therefore have I set it far from them. 
And isn't that what happens in Revelation? The image of the beast? Verse 21. And I will give it into the hands of the strangers for a prey, and to the wicked of the earth for a spoil, and they shall pollute it. My face will I also turn from them, and they shall pollute my secret place, for the robber shall enter into it and defile it. Make a chain, for the land is full of bloody crimes, and the city is full of violence. Oof. Read this carefully. Listen carefully. Wherefore, I will bring the worst of the heathen. Let's read that again. Wherefore, I will bring the worst of the heathen, and they shall possess their houses. I will also make the pomp of the strong to cease, and their holy places shall be defiled. People, what's going on in Europe? England, the United States, aren't we being flooded with heathen aliens? Wherefore I will bring the worst of the heathen, and they shall possess their houses, and their holy places shall be defiled. Do you know they're taking churches and turning them into mosques and different uh, you know, like Hindu temples. Did you know that? It's happening all over Europe and the UK and the United States. I mean, it, this is coming. It's here. It's not coming. It's here. Wherefore, I will bring the worst of the heathen, and they shall possess their houses. Do you know they're kicking Germans out of their houses to make way for their migrants? The heathens. Yeah, I read about that. You don't read about it much, but every once in a while a story will get through. Verse 25. Destruction cometh, and they shall seek peace, and there shall be none. Mischief shall come upon mischief, and rumor shall be upon rumor. Then shall they seek a vision of the prophet, but the law shall perish from the priest and counsel from the ancients. The king shall mourn, and the prince shall be clothed with desolation, and the hands of the people of the land shall be troubled. I will do unto them after their way, and according to their deserts will I judge them. And they shall know that I am the Lord." All right, let's go to Ezekiel chapter 13. Um, I don't know if you know it, but um, numbers pop up in the Bible. And 11 and 13 are numbers that are usually, my experience, not something very nice. Uh, the good numbers are generally 1, 3, 5, 7, 10, 12, 24, 40. Those numbers are usually associated with good things. 6, 11, 13, those numbers are not. So, you know, that's one thing. Uh, the King James Bible, I've noticed that they did, when they, when they did the uh, cha chapter divisions, you know, it used to be, the book of, a book in a Bible would just be on a, a roll, a scroll. And, you know, then they decided to divide it up into chapters, and then they divided it up into verses so that you can find things easier. And I truly believe that the hand of God was involved in this because it just, it just lays out so well. Um, I pay attention to this kind of stuff, you know, but it's not anything of my greatness. It's just things that uh, I've picked up and 
you know, if the Lord doesn't show you something, you don't know nothing. At least that's how I look at it. I mean, and this isn't because of anything great that I know. And uh, whoever were the men that did this, divided the Bible up into chapters and books, uh, I truly believe that they were led of the Lord. So, without further ado, let's read Ezekiel chapter 13. This could apply to all the TV preachers today. All your big, big name churches. You know, I've been, uh, oh, I got invited to go to church with some people. Calvary Chapel down in Fort Lauderdale. That place was so big. There were so many people. Uh, my, it took me 15 minutes to find the car. You know, they had parking lots and parking lots and parking lots. And I didn't pay attention. And uh, it did. It took me 15 minutes to find the car. And I sat through that. And I thought, you know, if I was Satan himself sitting in the pews, I wouldn't have been in, offended in the least. You know, the guy was like telling jokes and telling stories and talking about his golf game. You know, I was like, really? Do I care that you, you know, almost got a hole in one or whatever? I mean, I don't remember exactly, but I'm just saying, you know. And the Little League team you're sponsoring and blah, 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 whatever, you know. I'm just kind of throwing stuff out there. I don't really remember. I just remember the sermon was dead. They played rock and roll music. And you know, I was a rock and roller, people. I mean, I, I was. One of my favorite groups was uh, listening to Jimi Hendrix back in the day. Thank you, Lord, for delivering me from darkness to light. Ezekiel chapter 13. And the word of the Lord came to me, unto me, saying, Son of man, prophesy, prophecy against the prophets of Israel. You could substitute preacher, minister, priest. Prophecy against the prophets of Israel, that prophecy and say thou unto them that prophecy out of their own hearts. Yeah, they're speaking out of their own hearts, not from the Lord. And say unto them that prophecy out of their own hearts, hear ye the word of the Lord. Thus saith the Lord God, Woe unto the foolish prophets that follow their own spirit and have seen nothing. Oh, boy. TBN, anybody? O Israel, thy prophets are like the foxes in the deserts. Ye have not gone up into the gaps, neither made up the hedge for the house of Israel to stand in the, ba in the battle in the day of the Lord. Now, I'm, I was in the army. And ladies and guys, gentlemen that haven't been in the army, um, when you have a battle line, one of the worst things that could happen is you, you have a gap. And then the enemy can pour through the gap. And then you've got people in front of you and behind you attacking you. And when that happens, you're in big trouble. And that's what it's saying here. Standing in the gap. Neither made up the hedge. Uh, you know, a hedge is like a fence. You know, you want to keep the enemy out. And, and the Lord, you know, the Lord's telling Ezekiel here that these pastors, these prophets, they didn't stand into the gap. They didn't make up a hedge for the day of battle and the day of the Lord. They didn't do it. They just let the enemy go walking through the lines to get behind. Verse 6. They have seen vanity and lying 
divination. You know what divination is? Witchcraft. Saying, the Lord saith, and the Lord hath not sent them. And the Lord hath not sent them. Sounds like TBN to me. And they have made others to hope that they would confirm the word. Have ye not seen a vain vision? You know what vain is? Worthless. Have ye not seen a vain vision? Have ye not spoken a lying divination? Whereas ye say, the Lord saith it, albeit I have not spoken. Here these monsters were saying, thus saith the Lord, and the Lord saying, uh-uh, I didn't send you. Well, maybe their Lord sent them, but not the God of heaven, not the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Nope. Verse 8. Therefore thus saith the Lord God, because ye have spoken vanity and seen lies, therefore behold, I am against you, saith the Lord God. And mine hand shall be upon the prophets that see vanity and that divine lies. They shall not be in the assembly of my people, neither shall they be written in the writing of the house of Israel. Um, I believe this is an illusion, uh, illusion, not illusion. I believe this is alluding to the book of life at the end times. Um, there's going to be a whole lot of people looking for their favorite TV preachers on TBN to be in heaven. And uh, I don't think they're going to be there. I, that's just my opinion. You know, I don't, I don't make those decisions. The Lord does. Of course, there's going to be a lot of people that knew me growing up, and they're going to go, Bob Walker? What are you doing here? And I'm just going to say, by the grace of God, and I'll be like, boy, if, boy, if you could be saved, anybody could be saved. Well, that's almost true. They shall not be in the assembly of my people, neither shall they be written in the writing of the house of Israel, neither shall they enter into the land of Israel, and ye shall know that I am the Lord God, because even because they have seduced my people spiritually, some of them physically, even because they have seduced my people, saying, peace, and there was no peace. So let's break down verse 10. Because even because they have seduced my people, saying, Peace, and there was no peace. So they're telling everybody, Oh, you're going to escape. You're not going to see war. You're going to be out of here for the pre-trib rapture. And one built up a wall, and lo, others daubed it with untempered mortar. Now, ladies and guys that, you know, never worked construction... Um, mortar is like cement, like concrete, and you put it in between the bricks and it holds the bricks together. But when it's untempered, it's just like taking uh, some dirt and mixing it with water and using that. And it just, you know, once it dries out, it doesn't stick. It doesn't hold anything together. So what happens when you have a wall built with untempered mortar? Well, when a wind comes or a rainstorm, it just falls over. Or if it's, you know, somebody leans against it, it's not secured. So, verse 11, Say unto them which daub it with untempered mortar, that it shall fail, that it shall fall. There shall be an overflowing shower, and ye, O great hailstone, shall fall, and a stormy wind shall rend it. Lo, when the wall is fallen, 
Shall it not be said unto you, Where is the daubing wherewith ye have daubed it? Um, you ever heard of a mud dauber? You know, they build uh, nests out of mud. You know, and it sticks together. I guess they use their saliva or something. I don't know. But that's what they're talking about, daubing it. Uh, wherefore, thus saith the Lord God, I will even rend it with a stormy wind in my fury, and there shall be an overflowing shower in mine anger and great hailstones in my fury to consume it. Oh boy, I don't want to be anywhere near the Lord's great hailstones. I'll tell you that. So will I break down the wall that ye have daubed with untempered mortar and bring it down to the ground so that the foundation thereof shall be discovered and it shall fall and ye shall be consumed in the midst thereof and ye shall know that I am the Lord. I am of the opinion that these false preachers are building walls where the Lord doesn't want it. And they're tearing down the walls that the Lord wants. But that's what I believe this is in reference to. The Lord's going to tear these walls down. Verse 15, Thus will I accomplish my wrath upon the wall and upon them that have daubed it with untempered mortar and will say unto you, The wall is no more, neither they that daubed it. To wit, the prophets of Israel, which prophecy concerning Jerusalem and which see visions of peace for her and there is no peace saying the Lord God see instead of these people preaching repentance and returning to the Lord in obedience they just told them oh don't worry about it you're God's chosen people we're not uh, we're not subject to the wrath of God we're not under God's wrath. We're going to fly out of here in the pre-trib rapture. You know, all those things that God warned, Jesus warned us about, Matthew 24, about war and famine and pestilence, that's for the other guys. That's not for us. So don't worry about it. What's the difference? There is no difference. Verse 17, Likewise thou, son of man, set thy face against the daughters of thy people, which prophesy out of their own heart, and prophesy thou against them. And say, Thus saith the Lord God, Woe to the women that sew pillows to all armholes, and make kerchiefs upon the head of every stature to hunt souls. Will ye hunt the souls of my people? And will ye save the souls alive that come unto you? Good question. Good question. Verse 19. And will ye pollute me among my people for handfuls of barley and for pieces of bread to slay the souls that should not die and to save the souls alive that should not live? By your lying to my people that hear your lies. Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I am against your pillows, wherewith ye there hunt the souls to make them fly. I wonder if this is the pre-trib rapture, people. And I will tear them from your arms and will let the souls go, even the souls that ye hunt, to make them fly. Your kerchiefs also will I tear and deliver my people out of your hand, and they shall be no more in your hand to be hunted, and ye shall know that I am the Lord. Because with lies, lies, ye have made the heart of the righteous sad, whom I have not made sad, and strengthened the hands of the wicked, that he should not return from his wicked way by promising him life. Let me tell you something, people. I can show you churches in San Francisco right now. They use Bibles that completely obliterate sodomy from the Bible. And their preachers, if you want to call them that, tell them, well, after all, God made us this way. 
they'll say to their congregation, you know, it's not a sin. As long as you're in a committed relationship, it's not a sin. And they absolutely believe this. They absolutely believe this. God blinds these people. You want proof? I'll prove it to you. Let me finish Ezekiel 13. Wherefore ye shall see no more vanity nor divine divinations, for I will deliver my people out of your hand, and ye shall know that I am the Lord. Now, if you want to go and do your own research on this, and I've got previous Bible studies where I've covered this before, but in Ezekiel 14.9, Ezekiel 14, verse 9. And if the prophet be deceived when he hath spoken a thing, I the Lord, I the Lord have deceived that prophet. Not the devil. I the Lord have deceived that prophet. And I will stretch out my hand upon him and will destroy him from the midst of my people. Now in Revelation 20, 10, we read, And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. And that people is a long time. So not only does the Lord allow the devil to deceive people, the Lord himself will deceive people when they want their idols, their sins, more than they want the Lord. You know, the thing is, when you want the Lord more than anything else in this world, he'll find you. You won't have to find him. He'll find you. And that's a promise. But when you want your secret sin, when you want to be openly gay and celebrate pride and your LBGT, whatever, God will deceive you in your abominations. And you're going to think you're saved when you're damned to hell. And that, my friends, is a scary thought. In Deuteronomy 4.29, it says, But if from thence thou shalt seek the Lord thy God, thou shalt find him. If thou seek him with all thy heart and with all thy soul. You know, when you love the Lord, he's not going to deceive you. That's just the way it is. But how many people truly love the Lord? All right, we're... Uh, Let's go to do Ezekiel chapter 34. You know, Jeremiah is a depressing book for a lot of it. Isaiah can be up depressing. Ezekiel can be depressing. Just looking at the spiritual state of the white Western world is depressing. I mean, it's just unbelievable. You know, it's just... It's just the things that they tolerate now. Ezekiel chapter 34, verse 1. And the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, prophesy against the shepherds of Israel. Now, we're not talking about people out in the field with sheep. There's a spiritual application of those people. You know, Christ said he was the good shepherd. And I know that one day I'm going to have to give an account for every word that I taught. And I'm, I try to be careful about what I teach. You know, if something's my opinion, I'll tell you, hey, this is my opinion. You know, thus saith Bob, which, you know, is, doesn't really matter. I mean, I could be wrong, and I'm sure I'm wrong on some things. But when something is in the Bible, and I'm positive, I try to let you know. Prophesy 
against the shepherds of Israel, prophesy and say to them, Thus saith the Lord God unto the shepherds, Woe be to the shepherds of Israel that do feed themselves. Should not the shepherds feed the flocks? Oh yeah. They should be feeding the flocks. Ye eat the fat, ye clothed you with the wool, ye kill them that are fed, but ye feed not the flock. The diseased have ye not strengthened, neither have ye healed that which was sick, neither have ye bound up that which was broken, neither have ye bought, brought again that which was driven away, neither have ye sought that which was lost. But with force and with cruelty have ye ruled them. You know, I read that and I think of the Catholic Church. But, hey, that's just my observation. And they were scattered because there is no shepherd. And they became meat to all the beasts of the field when they were scattered. My sheep wandered through all the mountains and upon every high hill. Yea, my flock was scattered upon all the face of the earth, and none did search or seek after them. Therefore, ye shepherds, hear the word of the Lord. Boy, this, this isn't going to be good. As I live, saith the Lord God, surely because my flock became a prey, and my flock became meat to every beast of the field, because there was no shepherd, neither did my shepherds search for my flock, but the shepherds fed themselves and fed not my flock. Therefore, O ye shepherds, hear the word of the Lord. Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I am against the shepherds, and I will require my flock at their hand. Ooh. That's, uh, he means he's going to hold them accountable, people. In case you hadn't figured that one out, right? And cause them to cease from feeding the flock. Neither shall the shepherds feed themselves any more, for I will deliver my flock from their mouth, that they may not be meat for them. For thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I, even I, will both search my sheep and seek them out. As a shepherd seeketh out his flock in the day that he is among his sheep that are scattered, so will I seek out my sheep and will deliver them out of all places where they have been scattered in the cloudy and dark day. And I will bring them out from the people and gather them from the countries and will bring them to their own land and feed them upon the mountains of Israel by the rivers in all the inhabited places of the country. I will feed them in a good pasture, and upon the high mountains of Israel shall their fold be. There shall they lie in a good, field, a good fold, and in a fat pasture shall they feed upon the mountains of Israel. I will feed my flock, and will cause them to lie down, saith the Lord God. I will seek that which was lost, and bring again that which was driven away, and will bind up that which was broken, and will strengthen that which was sick. But I will destroy the fat and the strong. I will feed them with judgment. And as for you, O my flock, thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I judge between cattle and cattle, between the rams and the he-goats. Seemeth it a small thing unto you to have eaten up the good pasture? But ye must tread down with your feet the residue of your pastures, and to have drunk of the deep waters, but ye must but ye must foul the residue with your feet. And as for my flock, they eat that which ye have trodden with your feet, and they drink that which ye have fouled with your feet. Therefore thus saith the Lord God unto them, Behold, I, even I, will judge between the fat cattle and between the lean cattle." Because ye have thrust with side and with shoulders and pushed all the diseased with your horns till ye have scattered them abroad. Therefore will I save my flock 
and they shall no more be a prey. And I will judge between cattle and cattle, and I will set up one shepherd over them. And I will set up one shepherd over them. And he shall feed them, even my servant David. Isn't Christ the son of David? Oh, yeah. He shall feed them, and he shall be their shepherd. Wow. We're going to have to go uh, do a little bit of that when we uh, finish this chapter up. What do you think? And I, the Lord, will be their God, and my servant David, a prince among them. I, the Lord, hath spoken it. And I will make with them a covenant of peace. Now, this is the Lord's peace. This is not the peace of the Antichrist, the devil, the beast, the man of sin, the son of perdition. Big difference. Big difference. And I will make with them a covenant of peace and will cause the evil beasts to cease out of the land. And they shall dwell safely in the wilderness and sleep in the woods. Uh, are these four-legged beasts? Or are they two-legged beasts? Verse 36. And I will make them in the places round about my hill a blessing, and I will cause the shower to come down in his season. There shall be showers of blessings. Blessing. And the tree of the field shall yield her fruit, and the earth shall yield her increase, and they shall be safe in their land, and shall know that I am the Lord, when I have broken the bands of their yoke, and delivered them out of the hand of those that serve themselves of them. And they shall no more be a prey to the heathen. And not P-R-A-Y, but P-R-E-Y, like a bird of prey, like an eagle. And they shall no more be a prey to the heathen. Neither shall the beast of the land devour them, but they shall dwell safely, and none shall make them afraid. And I will raise up for them a plant of renown, and they shall be no more consumed with hunger in the land, neither bear the shame of the heathen any more. Neither bear the shame of the heathen any more. Thus shall they know that I, the Lord their God, am with them, and they, and that they, even the house of Israel, are my people, saith the Lord God, and ye are my flock, the flock of my pasture, are men, and I am your God, saith the Lord God. Let's take a look at John chapter 10. You know, the Bible pronounces judgment upon the wicked, but it tells you of their ultimate doom and the reward of the righteous. So you have words of judgment, but you also have words of comfort. And, um, well, let's read John chapter 10, verse 1. Verily, verily, I say unto you, now this is Jesus speaking, not Bob. Let's listen to Jesus. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that entereth not by the door into the sheepfold, ah, but climbeth up some other way, the same as a thief, a thief and a robber. But he that entereth in by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the porter openeth, and the sheep hear his voice, and he calleth his own sheep by name, and leadeth them out. And when he putteth forth his own sheep, he goeth before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. And a stranger will they not follow, but will flee from him, for they know not the voice of strangers. This parable spake Jesus unto them, but they understood not what things they were which he spake unto them. Then said Jesus unto them again, Verily, verily, I say unto you, I am the door of the sheep. All that ever came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. The goats hear them, but the sheep did not hear them. I am the door. 
By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved, and shall go in and out and find pasture. The thief cometh not, but for to steal, and to kill, and to destroy. I am come that they might have life, and that they might have it more abundantly. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. But he that is an hireling, and not the shepherd, whose own the sheep are not, seeth the wolf coming, and leaveth the sheep, and fleeth. And the wolf catcheth them, and scattereth the sheep. The hiring fleeth, because he is an hireling, and careth not for the sheep. I am the good shepherd, and know my sheep, and am known of mine. As the Father knoweth me, even so know I the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. And other sheep I have, which are not of this fold. Them also I must bring, and they shall hear my voice, and there shall be one fold and one shepherd. Therefore doth the Father love me, because I lay down my life, that I might take it again. No man taketh it from me, but I lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it again. This commandment have I received of my Father. Now, the Lord had picked uh, Saul as a king. And Saul started off okay, but he ended up not obeying the Lord. And in 1 Samuel 15, 23, we read, For rebellion, rebelling against the Lord, for rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft, and stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. Because thou hast rejected the word of the Lord, he hath also rejected thee from being a king. Huh. So we should be we shouldn't be rebellious and stubborn. And uh that was my life as a teenager. All right, let's go to Micah chapter 3. Oh boy, I'll tell you what. There's I look I look around and I don't see anything different between Israel of old and the modern day today. I really don't. Micah chapter 3 verse 1. And I said, Here I pray you, O heads of Jacob, and ye princes of the house of Israel, is it not for you to know judgment? Who hate the good and love the evil. Sounds like Washington, D.C., London, Paris, Berlin, Rome. Sound any different? who hate the good and love the evil, who pluck off their skin from off them and their flesh from off their bones, who also eat the flesh of my people and flay their skin from off them, and they break their bones and chop them in pieces as for the pot and as flesh within the cauldron. Verse 4. Then shall they cry unto the Lord, but he will not hear them. Oh yeah, when you... Do evil for a certain amount of time, and when the Lord brings judgment upon you, they're going to cry to the Lord, and he's going to, he's, he's, well, he's, he's going to hear them, but he's not going to listen. He's not going to change his mind. Then shall they cry unto the Lord, but he will not hear them. He will even hide his face from them at that time, as they have behaved themselves ill in their doings. Thus saith the Lord concerning the prophets that make my people err. Err. That's where they get the word err. Wrong. That bite with their teeth and cry, Peace! And he that putteth not into their mouths, they even prepare war against him. Yes, while they're crying about peace, they're preparing for war. Therefore, 
night shall be unto you, that ye shall not have a vision. And it shall be dark unto you, that ye shall not divine, and the sun shall go down over the prophets, and the day shall be dark over them. Then shall the seers be ashamed. Now, a seer is just an Old Testament word. Uh, that's what they called a prophet back in the old days. A seer and a prophet is the same thing because they were considered being able to see the future. Then shall the seers be ashamed and the diviners confounded. Yea, they shall cover their lips for there is no answer of God. For truly I am full of power by the Spirit of the Lord and of judgment and of might to declare unto Jacob his transgression and to Israel his sin. Hear this, I pray you, ye heads of the house of Jacob and princes of the house of Israel that abhor or hate that abhor judgment and pervert all equity. What's equity? Well, if you were in an auto accident and the other person was at fault, um, if you went to court, equity would be that the um, they would have to make good for the damage done. That's equity. Listen to verse 10. They build up Zion with blood. Zionism, anybody? They build up Zion with blood and Jerusalem with iniquity. What's iniquity? Sin, wickedness, evil. They build up Zion with blood and Jerusalem with iniquity. The heads, therefore, judge for reward. The judges take bribes. And the priests thereof teach for hire. Yeah. Do you ever notice that I don't beg for money every time? The priests therefore teach for hire, and the prophets thereof divine for money. Yet will they lean upon the Lord and say, Is not the Lord among us? Is not the Lord among us? None evil can come upon us. Doesn't that sound familiar? Sounds like, sounds like your modern church world, pre-trib rapture people. None evil can come upon us. We're going to be out of here in the pre-trib rapture. Verse 12. Therefore shall Zion for your sake be plowed as a field, and Jerusalem shall become heaps, and the mountain of the house as the high places of the forest. Solomon said, there's nothing new under the sun. People, this is, it's no different today than it was a couple thousand years ago. It's not any different today than it was in the days of Christ. You know, God wanted to be the people, the king of the people. They didn't want him. So what did he do? He sent the Assyrians, which were evil. These people were bad news. They used to take fish hooks and put it through the mouths of the captives. How would you like to take a big old fish hook and put it through your lips or your jaw? And this was to honor their God, Dagon. Uh, what does Dagon look like? Dagon, if you want to see what Dagon looks like, go watch Disney's The Little Mermaid. From the waist down, it was a fish, and from the, the uh, waist up, it was a man. Yeah. And then, um, and then the Babylonians took, came and took Judah. The Assyrians took Israel, the Babylonians took Judah. After they returned, after 70 years, back to uh, the land of Jerusalem, uh, back to the city of Jerusalem, uh, then who came? Uh, Alexander, who's called the Great. I don't know how great he was. The Lord let him die when he was 
or in his early or mid-30s, it is said he never lost a battle. But he conquered the entire land. Uh, perhaps you've heard of Alexandria, Egypt. It had allegedly had the greatest library the world had ever known. Well, after the Romans came, they burned it. I have to wonder if it was the library was full of garbage that the Lord allowed it to be destroyed. I, I don't know. But the thing is, Alexander had conquered the area. He was a Greek, a Macedonian, which I believe is a province of Greece. Some people will argue and say Macedonia and Greece are two different places. Eh, that's like saying Florida or Texas or New York are different than the United States. I mean, the Macedonians, they look like the Greeks. They spoke the same language, you know. It's sort of like the United States and Canada, I guess, you know. We might be different countries, but we're the same people, or at least we were back in the day. Not the flood of heathens, but uh, but the thing is, Alexander had conquered the land of Israel. And guess what language they spoke? They spoke Greek. That whole area spoke Greek. Greek was the language of commerce, business. If you wanted to do business in the Middle East, you better know Greek in the days of Christ. The Romans were fairly newcomers, and uh, business was Greek, but the official business was probably conducted in Latin and or Greek. I mean, you'd be surprised at how many Romans citizens knew Greek. You know, when you go to Europe, um, if you only know one language, you're considered, almost considered illiterate. I mean, most Europeans know two or three languages. So, you know, uh, and they teach high, in high schools, uh, Denmark and in Germany uh, and in Austria, they teach English. And it's, it's mandatory. It's not an elective. It's mandatory. Uh, so, you know, English is the uh, most popular second language in the world. I mean, if you've got a college degree in anything, a four-year college degree, you can go pretty much anywhere in the world, uh, uh, particularly Asia, and get a job teaching English if you're a native speaker. And if you got a master's degree in English with a English as a second language certification, uh, those jobs pay pretty darn good. You'd be surprised. Um, they make pretty good money. I mean, you go live in a third world country making that kind of money and you, you live like a king. You'll have, you know, if you're a guy, you'll have girls swarming all over you, the heathens. Pretty heathens, but they're heathens. I'm an expert on that, um, unfortunately. But, um, or was, I should say. But the thing is, when Alexander conquered the area, he set up the area for the New Testament to be written in Greek. People will lie to you and tell you it was written in Hebrew. It was not written in Hebrew. It was written in Greek. When they tell you his name was Yeshua HaMashiach, no. No. Read Matthew 1. Gabriel gave Jesus his name. Told Mary what to call him. Told Joseph what to call him. Gabriel was sent of the Lord. He was the angel protector of Israel, one of. So was Michael. Now, why why Greek? Well, let's go to the book of Joel, chapter 3, real quick. For behold, in those days and in that time will I bring again the captivity of Judah and Jerusalem. I will also gather all nations and will bring them down into the valley of Jehoshaphat, 
and will plead with them there for my people and for my heritage, Israel, whom they have scattered among the nations and parted my land. I believe, now don't hold me to this, I believe, I'm not sure, and I shouldn't probably shouldn't even be saying this if I'm not 100% sure, but I believe the Valley of Jehoshaphat is um, the same as Armageddon. I'm not 100% sure. If anybody knows and can show me from the Bible, I'd appreciate it. I just don't want to look it up because I've already gone an hour on this Bible study and uh, it's almost 4.30 in the morning and I'm tired. But uh, got to serve the Lord. So, uh, verse 3. And they have cast lots for my people. You know, drawing straws. And have given a boy for an harlot and sold a girl for wine that they might drink. Yea, and what have ye to do with me, O Tyre and Zidon, and all the coasts of Palestine? Will ye render me a recompense? And if ye recompense me swiftly and speedily, will I return your recompense upon your own head? Now Tyre and Zidon were um, cities where the Canaanites were known to be. Um, there's possibility that they were not originally well, I don't know. They probably were originally Canaanites. Then Israel moved in, but then they didn't get rid of them. And instead of getting rid of the Canaanites, they married them against the wishes of the Lord. So they destroy the bloodlines. Next thing you know, what happens? Uh, they become, the children become Canaanites. So, Tyre and Zidon helped uh, carry away some of the, of the people into slavery. That's what happened. Verse 5. Because you have taken my silver and my gold and carried into your temples my goodly, pleasant things. The children also of Judah and the children of Jerusalem have ye sold unto the Grecians that ye might remove them far from their border. Ah! The children also of Judah and the children of Jerusalem have ye sold, into slavery, right? Have ye sold unto the Grecians, the Greeks, that ye might remove them far from their border. Why was the New Testament in Greek? Because some of the children of Judah were went to Greece. They were sold as slaves. How many? I don't know. Do you know? The Lord knows. Huh. Maybe that's why. Behold, I will raise them out of the place whither ye have sold them, and will return your recompense upon your own head. And I will sell your sons and your daughters into the hand of the children of Judah, and they shall sell them to the Sabaeans, to a people far off, for the Lord hath spoken it. Wow. Proclaim ye this among the Gentiles. Prepare war. Wake up the mighty men. Let all the men of war draw near. Let them come up. Beat your plowshares into swords and your pruning hooks into spears. Let the weak say, I am strong. Huh. Positive confession. Let the weak say, I am strong. Assemble yourselves and come, all ye heathen, and gather yourselves together round about. Thither cause thy mighty ones to come down, O Lord. Let the heathen be, uh, be wakened and come up to the valley of Jehoshaphat, for there will I sit to judge all the heathen round about. Put ye in the sickle, for the harvest is ripe. Come, get you down, for the press is full, the fats overflow, for their wickedness is great. This is language just like in the book of Revelation about the angel putting a sickle to the earth to reap the harvest. 
verse 14. Multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision. Ah, make a decision, people. Are you for Christ or are you for the devil? For the day of the Lord is near in the valley of decision. The sun and the moon shall be darkened, and the stars shall withdraw their shining. The Lord also shall roar out of Zion and utter his voice from Jerusalem, and the heavens and the earth shall shake. Language right out of the book of Revelation. But I don't understand the book of Revelation. You ever read the Old Testament? Well, no, that's, that's the book for the you-know-whos. My pastor told me not to read that. Of course he told you not to read that. You'd be asking him questions he can't answer without trying to deceive you. For the day of the Lord is near in the valley of decision. The sun and the moon shall be darkened, and the stars shall withdraw their shining. Right out of the book of Revelation. The Lord also shall roar out of Zion and utter his voice from Jerusalem, and the heavens and the earth shall shake. But the Lord will be the hope of his people and the strength of the children of Israel. So shall ye know that I am the Lord your God, dwelling in Zion, my holy mountain. Then shall Jerusalem be holy. Then shall Jerusalem be holy. Well, it ain't holy today, I'm telling you that. Then shall Jerusalem be holy, and there shall no strangers pass through her any more. And it shall come to pass in that day that the mountains shall drop down new wine, and the hills shall flow with milk, and all the rivers of Judah shall flow with waters, and a fountain shall come forth of the house of the Lord, and shall water the valley of Shittim. Remember Jesus said that there'd be rivers of living waters? Oh yeah. 19. Egypt shall be a desolation, and Edom shall be a desolate wilderness, for the violence against the children of Judah, because they have shed innocent blood in their land. But Judah shall dwell forever, and Jer Jerusalem from generation to generation. For I will cleanse their blood that I have not cleansed. For the Lord dwelleth in Zion. All right, people. Um, I guess that's going to be the end of part four. So I guess I'm going to have to do at least a part five. All blessings, praise, glory, and honor to God the Father and His only begotten Son, Jesus, who is the Christ, the Lamb of God slain from the foundation of the world. All blessings, praise, glory, and honor to Him. In Jesus' name, amen.